percent. Uh, you know, whatever. I'll just leave it. It can change it a little bit if it wants. Um, all right. Select content. So this one's a little bit trickier. You have to just pick your book now. If this were not a book with lots of pictures, what I would do instead is just select the content on the page that I want it to be included. And I like to include page numbers and things like that because I like the, to be able to search for the page number and things. But, um, but lots of people will just do the text within the body of their fiction piece or whatever. So uh, I want to apply this to every other page. So it'll go down. And then with this one, I do the same thing. See, sometimes it'll pick this other page accidentally. Okay. Apply to every other page. Okay, so margins is the thing I was telling you about where, you know, when you open up your, your reader, sometimes you've got an image in the middle that's kind of got some text on it, and then there's a white border around the outside. I don't know if you guys have seen that. My personal feeling is that that's a waste of my real estate. So this is how you would set up to do that if you wanted, but I always set mine to zero. And so apply to all pages. And then I want all my book, all my pages to be the same. Apply to all pages. So I'm pretty sure, let's see if this is working right. Hmm, didn't really apply to all the pages. Oh yeah, it did. Oh, okay, this yeah. is what, the, you know what you're seeing here? This is an interesting problem. The screen usually tells you on, on, the, on the camera what your zoom level is. So you have to make sure the zoom level is the same on both of your, on both of your, um, your cameras. Because I had the zoom level a little bit different on the two cameras, it thinks that some of the pages are larger than the other ones, which is kind of making it tricky. So um, I'm just gonna leave it like it is because Fixing it requires kind of unchecking this, and I, I just don't want to goof it up. Okay, so so I hit. You have to hit the output button before to cut off the margins and everything before you go to the output screen. And then the output, it it, it isn't like OCR output or um, or PDF output. It simply uh, is the final output of the the TIFF images or whatnot. So in this case. It's, let's see what it's trying to do. It's going to recommend turning everything to black and white, which isn't my preference. I'm going to switch everything to 300 DPI, and um, I'm going to say color grayscale. If it were a standard textbook with images and lots of text, I would choose uh, mixed, but I'm just going to do color grayscale for this one, and then apply to all pages, and then the dewarping you can do. And that would require these tabs, which actually took me a little while to find. You see how they've got like, you can switch your picture zones, fill zones, dewarping. But I don't know why dewarping would be the last step, but it is. Okay, so now I hit output. So what it's doing now is, you know, I had it set an output directory. So what it does is it creates one in this Arizona 2 folder in here in the out. Okay. All right. Um, this is actually really interesting. I, I uh, this was the other another book I was working on. You know, it'll it'll read the, these words in Spanish and recognize them in output. So I, I've been surprised. The Tesseract program does like 23 languages, and it's it's, it's pretty impressive how uh, how the software works. There's probably what, only like only five languages in the default install of ABBY. So what we'll do, um, let's see, close the document. Uh, let's see. Close. Uh, okay. So 
this is a good one that would go to PDF well, right? Because you're not wanting just raw text. Uh, file to PDF. And then this is a different output directory. Let me get to the AZ1 out. Okay, so as it opens it, since this is a setup task, it, it automatically goes through and starts to recognize words, look for text, and, uh, and try to OCR the text. It's trying to, um, it's, uh, and then it tries to save it as a PDF. So it automatically saves as a PDF. Obviously, I need to do some cleanup. The first page is that blank thing. And uh, I might have still, you know what, I probably still had it on Spanish, so it's not recognizing a lot of words. <laughs> So here, it looks like it recognized this stuff, see? And uh, you can tell it if you want to put the text on top or to, the, to put the text underneath the image and some other things like that. You can tell it if you want to optimize for a space or to uh, kind of give you a balance. But this is a, you know, this is a searchable PDF. Um, let me close this down. Obviously, it missed some words. If you want to kind of see how well it did, you can, um, over here on the right, let's see, it's thinking that, let's find one that, it, so, you know, good morning, scorpion. It's not recognizing any of the words because it's all Spanish, but um, you can correct it if you want. Um, I just leave it because I'm kind of lazy. And... Um, you can click, if you click on these blue words, it'll show you what, um, what they look like. Oh, here we go. You can tell it that's not a letter or whatnot. If you want to output it to, um, to uh, you know, this program will output to an EPUB, which you can't put on your uh, Kindle. And a lot of people use Kindles. And then you have to open up the app with, um, you have to open up the, the file and do some conversions in Calibre. Calibre is a really good uh, conversion software. So, uh, for ebooks. So, let's see. So, it's kind of a final words. It's a neat project because you do a little bit of pro, you know, you can program a little bit in the CHDK. You can use your command line interface if you want. You can use, you know, GUI. You do a little bit of construction. You use wood. You do a little bit of soldering. It's the kind of project that's that's fun because it kind of includes a little bit of everything. So uh, it, it's not something that, like, I don't think you could get this done in a weekend. It's kind of one of those several weekend projects, but it's a good challenge. So if you want to do it, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you guys have any. What are some of the legal implications of sharing your uh, your work? So, yeah, sharing your work is like sharing, you know, someone else's images or sharing someone else's artwork or sharing software. You just don't do it. So, you know, that's obviously not one of the benefits that I see in this. And that's a benefit that a pirate would see in this. <laughs> it's legal to, to scan your own books. There is... Um, there have been some cases where people have been able to um, uh, defend themselves, that it's okay. However, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody who successfully defended themselves for you know, illegal book sharing. How illegal, would, how illegal would it be to scan like a college book and put, make it available? <laughs> yeah, horribly illegal. I do not want anyone to think that I could own that. <laughs> Although, I know people who've done it. So, you know, any other about ethically considering that it's educational material? Okay, I, I, I don't know all the, the, the issues with fair use, but my, um, uh, my experience with fair use is that sharing uh, uh, articles for single purposes of a class is acceptable, and, I, and that's been defended. I'm obviously not a lawyer, but if you have any medical questions, I can answer those. That's okay. okay. Can you come look at this? <laughs> I've got a rash. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where I work at, we have to compi uh, comply with the FDA requirements for good documentation practices. Mm -hmm. Can this be used to take our DHRs or uh, 
device history reports, scan them in and check them for errors. And what, what, what kind of errors? Well, on the paperwork, the big issue is, is we don't want to send any paper out with any errors on it, like the mm -hmm. dates are done wrong or a field is not filled mm -hmm. in where it should be filled in. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to have any blank lines. Uh, you have to write the date in a specific order. You can't just write it any old way. It has to be like the 27th of February of 2013. There's all that stuff, and if you make a mistake, you have to cross it out, initial it, and then write down at the bottom why you had to correct it. So having something we can scan before anything goes out would be great because that could yeah. Because no matter how many humans so you have, so do you tend to, to keep it in books or do you tend to keep it in sheets of paper? Uh, there are binders about this big for each. Uh, Scanner. There are some really, so there are other book scanning folks who use what would be described as destructive methods of book scanning, where you go to Kinko's and you pay them a buck fifty to chop off the binding of your book. And then you have a stack, it's like a ream of paper. And for about 500 bucks you can get an amazing uh, duplex scanner that uh, you can put 100 pages in at a time and it just, it sends you the PDF goes to the OCR and it comes with the fine reader software and so that's kind of seems more in line with what you're talking about yeah. maintaining an electronic copy of your documentation before you send it out and get rid of it so not something you want to do with the 17th century Bible or anything right? yeah exactly <laughs> this is I put a 17th century Bible in that actually well, this isn't archival quality there are folks that are really interested in archival quality and what uh, and I, I don't know that any of them are happy with this kind of thing. However, if you look at archival quality prints, they're not perfect either. They tend to use uh, sort of that the flat method that I showed you, where you just put one sheet of glass on top of it. Because mm -hmm. our DHRs are in a binder, so we can take them apart and scan them through. What would be really nice is have something that can critique all of the DHRs for any errors before oh, yeah. we send out the gantry or send anything out to be shipped. So you're, yeah, you're asking about checking for fields being filled out. Yeah. And uh, in fact, in, in medicine, I know we've got we've got OCR software that does that and makes that will check to see what areas of the chart you filled out on a standardized form, because sadly we're built based on or we build people based on what we've done, not based on how you know what do they needed it or not. And so it's not the content that matters. As long as I wrote anything in that area, you know, I, I can build for that thing. It's, of course, based on diagnosis, too. I mean, you have to be sick enough. But that's a different problem. Any other questions? Let's see the details of your trigger for the cameras. So, the, so what I did exactly is I took a standard uh, USB um, plug that came with my phone. It has a USB plug on it. I took two mini USB plugs, or mini USB cables, and I cut them. And I took the one end and I checked to make sure that they use the standard um, wiring, which is red is positive, black is negative, or in this case it was yeah, black is negative, and then there's a white and a green uh, power line. On the tip of the um, mini USB, there are five wires, one of which corresponds to nothing, and the other four to those wires. I, uh, I do not remember which wire is which, but if you look for the schematic online, it's really easy to find. But all you need to know is that you're running the five volts to the standard power lines. And so what I did is on the other end, I've got red going to what came off of the red. Well, I should talk about the intermediary step, which is the switch. So the black lines just run st uh, straight out to both of the negatives on the cameras. And then the red line goes to one end of the switch. And then on the other end of the switch, I've got two wires coming off, putting the two cameras in parallel. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, it actually was much easier than I thought. After reading the instructions, I got to wor worried about having to like check the pins and things like that and worried about frying my camera. But as long as you are only running the power in the same way that the power is meant to be run, you're A-OK. -okay. You ever had any repetitive stress injury symptoms from doing a few hundred pages with this button? 
Uh, I did it, but my arm, yes. It's not, it, not the butt, yeah, yeah. yeah. You start right. to feel it. Okay. And like I said, at first I had a pulley up here, but that was before I set up this upper lighting and it ended up being in the way of it. The pulley would, like I hung, I can't remember if it was five or 10 pounds off the back. You can lift it if you want, you can play with it. Are there any other questions? What is the transparent material made out of? So you can use standard glass, and most people do. I, uh, I got kind of interested in maybe having a little bit better image, so I purchased what's called museum glass. It's a high-end glass that you can purchase at Hobby Lobby, but there's, a, there's another kind of with a different brand name at uh, Michael's. And you just have to make sure you put the film on the right side, and you have to wash it with. You can't use standard ammonia-based cleaners. I actually have to clean it with. Uh, lighter fluid, of all things. Is this just a drawer hmm. slide under here? This is a drawer slide underneath. It's a keyboard drawer slide on the bottom to go back and forth. And then this on the side is just a standard uh, full length um, uh, drawer slide for a uh, cabinet. And then, um, you know, this is pretty much, you know, except for maybe 20% or so, most all of the rest is detailed almost picture by picture on the do-it-yourself uh, book scanning um, website on, in the forums. What's the longest photography session you've done where you're just going through the pages? I don't mean to Oh, I haven't. Same. No, it's okay. I haven't gone more than an hour or so. But I mean pages. Oh, pages? How many pages can you endure to do in an hour? Oh, uh, you know, there are, other, there are people that can go 500 in an hour. I can't do that. I can go like 200. You're not limping away after that. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. So, uh, you know, my platen is pretty heavy. The design that they had was to have two pieces of MDF, and I don't know if you guys know, but MDF is a very heavy wood. Um, so I actually used, um, uh, I don't remember, but this is some sort of pine, and this is an old uh, door to a cabinet that I use, and the back is the same way. It's just a couple pieces of pine. Most of all, most all of this is scrap wood except for these arms. I just wanted the arms. I thought a lot about the arms. These arms are a modification on what the website kind of talks about because I wanted to have more degrees of freedom. I mean, this, I thought about this for like four days because it's, you know, I got this degree, you know, I got, I can twist it this way. I can go up and down this way. I can rotate. I can go up and down here, so it works out real